Welcome everyone to the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival 2021 Q&As. I'm your host for this session, Julian Reeves. Thank you so much for joining us. This year, our full program will be screened online from September 22nd to the 28th. We also have our new media exhibition. You can check that out online or in person at Grandison Lab Belmont. It is on this Friday and also Saturday as well from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And also during this session, feel free to comment and ask any questions you have for the filmmakers, and we'll try to answer them you know, once we get time. And of course, don't forget, you can check out all of the films at watch.eventive.org backslash TTFF21. We'd also like to thank all our TTFF21 sponsors and partners. NGC is our signature sponsor this year, and we also have leading sponsorship from Shell, Trinidad and Tobago, and also from Republic Bank Limited. We also have contributing and supporting sponsorship from NLCB and the Sport and Culture Fund. And today I have with me Mr. Rudy Hippolyte, the director of the documentary, This Ain't Normal, about gangs and social workers in Boston. Welcome, Rudy. How are you doing? Thank you so much, uh, Julian. It's really a pleasure to be part of the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival. It's our pleasure to have you. All right. Well, I checked out the film, very powerful film. Um, Thank you. Yeah, what I noticed very early in the film, um, you, it's brought out about the extremely high concentration of gangs in Boston. I know you, you reside in Boston. Was it surprising to you? No, no, I, I had known about that there were, you know, many gangs in Boston. I didn't, I learned a lot. You know, it's like getting a PhD when you're out there filming. Uh, but I grew up uh, when I, I was born in Trinidad, but when my family migrated here, I pretty much, we ended up in Boston and in one of the low income neighborhoods. So I grew up in, you know, around young men who were involved in gangs. They were my friends. Okay. And uh, so I saw them very differently and, and becoming a filmmaker, I always wanted to be able to tell that story. So a few years ago, I had the opportunity and, uh, you know, I found an organization working with them. And so I, that's how I set out to make this project. So it's, again, it's, it's things that I knew. Um, you go into a film with a theory of what you might come up with. And I'm happy with this because you get a chance to see these young men in a very different light. And you, you, you see them uh, as human beings, just like you or I, without the opportunities that, uh, that we all should have. And that organization, that will be Street Safe Boston. That's Street correct. Film. Yeah. Okay. And you were talking about um, that well, you know, you grew up with, with some of these young men and these circumstances they face. Um, they're very, very blunt, very real with their, you know, what they're talking about. Tell me about um, how was it? Did you have to kind of build trust with them? Was a process or when you turn on the camera, they were like, just told you their whole lives. Tell me about that. Okay, Julian. So originally... Um, when, when I, uh, had the idea to do the film, I went to Street Save Boston, the organization working with them and, uh, you know, spoke to them, the, the Boston foundation were funding the program Street Save Boston. And so I had to convince them to allow me as a filmmaker to do this film because usually filmmakers going and go in and they exploit these kids. They okay. pretty much, you know have them brand brandishing guns and so on at the cameras, you know, so, so sensationalized. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, from my other uh, work that I'd done in the past, I had had some success and had things shown nationally on ESPN and PBS and so on. So I was able to go in, I spent three months kind of with the organization building trust and getting a sense of what the film would be. And originally, Julian, I thought the film would be about the organization, the street workers and the social workers who work with the young men. But they took me out to the street to meet some of the young men. And to my astonishment, the young men wanted to tell their story. I didn't think they would, but mm -hmm. they wanted to, because think about it, no one asked them, no one, you know, they ostracized their family members. So they wanted to tell their, their stories and I knew having grown up where I grew up, that there was a backstory, that there was something, you know, uh, whether it was uh, coming from a dysfunctional home, uh, whether it was, you know, a lack of opportunities, inequity in the school system, systemic racism, 
those were the things that really pointed them to this life of choosing to be in a gang and choosing friends, which happened to be from their neighborhoods, to try to battle some of the challenges of life together. Definitely, definitely. And, and as you mentioned that, I saw that there was an effort to not only talk about their illicit activities and their struggles and so forth, but also just to show them as their family life. We saw um, Jordan with his his daughters and so right. forth. Was that a, um, on your part? Is like, you know, I, I need to humanize them. Was that, or how did that happen? A hundred percent. I went in there. To, to allow them to tell their stories. So as a filmmaker, I thought it would be about the street safe staff. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the kids were willing to speak, I shifted, right? To make it mainly about the kids, but also the staff. Uh, I wanted to follow the kids. I wanted to show them in a different environment. So for Jordan, I wanted to show just like you or I, if you were a parent, he's a parent, you know? And to, it really, my, I went in there to be accurate, not to sugarcoat anything, but mm -hmm. actually to tell the story. And one of the things we always get, Julian, anybody seeing this film, it really humanizes these young men. And once you get that to see that these are young men and they're not like animals that we should discard mm -hmm. as a society, then we begin to see the commonality and why we need to help and do things differently as a society to to create programs to help. Yeah. And you mentioned the um the workers, the social workers and the, the street workers. And I, I was surprised that a lot of them also had a lot of issues with their family life and upbringing. Was was that surprising for you as well? No, most of the street workers were gang members mm -hmm. and yeah. were incarcerated and had made a commitment when they were there that when they came out, they would try to change that for other young people coming up. So Think about it, Julian. Who is best, uh, you know, suited to speak to these young men in a way that they understand and that they build trust with? Well, somebody who'd been through what they went through, who have turned their lives around. So it didn't surprise me. It made sense to me that if you have a program that, you know, for example, you're dealing with somebody who may be abusing drugs, you may want to have somebody who had that experience and had turned things around. And that's the same concept uh, that they had. Like they hired folks who had gone through it, who have now were, were out and were looking to do something positive for the community and for the young people. Yeah. And I was quite impressed by the level of commitment where you're talking about this is not a nine to five, no. right? it's a 24 seven job, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and they're fully committed, Julian. Mm -hmm. they, all the street workers, program coordinators, all the executive staff, who work for, for this organization, they're fully 24 seven committed and to this work and you have to be. Um, and they're not doing it, you know, for financial gain. They're doing it, you know, because they want to give back to their community. So um, yeah, it's a level of commitment that that was uh, something that astonished me that, wow, folks are that committed. And that's why the program has been successful I think, uh, in dealing with an issue that's very complicated. And the solutions are complicated, but I, I think the, um, the organization offers a blueprint on how you do this type of work and how you can reach these uh, young people. And, and I noticed um, there was a mention of the, the, the so-called the Boston Miracle. I think that would have been back, back in 1996 where you know, there was a big police lockdown and they had you know, no murders for an extended period. And then after that, the gangs, you know, mushroomed, you know. And right. then we, yeah. So, um, and then we, we compare that with the, the work with Street Safe, where they actually, they are changing lives. And it's, it seems like there's, there's quite the, the disconnect in, in approaches, where one side says, you know, lock them down. The other side says, hey, you know, we kind of lift them up. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. As you know, you know, we know that in the United States and in other countries, there was a mass incarceration that happened. Right. And that came from, you know, from all the way from uh, uh, Nixon, Reagan, in terms of administrations here, or even Democrats like Clinton, they were tough on crime. Right. Um, and what happened is rather than trying to figure out a solution and giving people the, the help that they need, they, they locked people up. And now we're learning for, for small petty crimes like 
you know, having, uh, you know, marijuana or, you know, for petty crimes. Now, once you lock these people up and you do this mass incarceration, what happens is you take away a father, you take away probably a mother. There's no one to raise that young person. Okay, so they're not thinking of the consequences. They're thinking, oh, we locked these people up. But if you lock them up, what are you doing for the young people who are left behind? And that's where they dropped the ball. Uh, the, you know, they didn't provide those type of social services, housing, you know, making sure these young people had something to eat, that they're connected to good education, that they have good mentors. No, they just left them out there. So what are these young people going to do? They grew up with their friends who are facing the same thing. And then they come up, come together and they do things that, uh, that may be illegal to put food on the table. And to, in some cases, to, um, to being the provider for the family, uh, for the younger siblings. So this is what we created. And now I think, you know, we have to be committed to doing things differently. Um, and, and, and what do you think is, is needed to kind of kind of bridge that gap to show the policymakers, well, okay, we have people who are out there doing the work and getting the results. These are the ones we need support, not, okay, we need more police, more arrests and so forth. What, what, what is needed to kind of, you know, get that light bulb to pop? I think we have to think about this not in terms of punishment, but rehabil rehabilitation, right? Because it's always been about lock him up, punishing. And if we think about it, like you have a young person and they may have committed uh, a crime at a young age, how can we reach that young person to give them other services so that they don't repeat? Um, and there are several ways you can do it. You can start young, you know, with, um, you know, providing the proper childcare, the proper educational system, really be, being committed to have good schools, good teachers. Uh, being committed in some cases. Now they're looking to pass a stimulus bill here that would provide uh, uh, income on a monthly basis to families, low-income families. Well, that's great because that family who may not have the nourishment, the money, the rent, now they have regular income. So that young person that's coming up will have something, social services, you know, it, it, you know mental health counseling. Because a lot of these kids are in situations where, you know, they're seeing their their friends die, they, you know, they're around a lot of violence. They're even, uh, uh, in, in many cases, uh, they're constantly under threat. So we have to provide mental health counseling. There's so many things we can do if we're committed. So again, the approach has to be not punishment, but finding other means to rehabilitate. And, and we were talking um, off camera about some of the impacts the film is already having. And, and tell me about that in terms of policy and changes that type of thing. Yeah, so recently um, we've had uh, more media attention because the film uh, received uh, an Emmy nomination, a national Emmy nomination for uh, best social issue documentary. So again, we're a small production company and we're competing with the networks. So just having that nomination has brought a lot of attention, which means that a lot more folks are seeing the film and we have screenings, you know, for example, set up with, uh, uh, you know, the big HMO here, Partners Healthcare, with the Massachusetts State Legislature. Now, we know once those folks see the film, they, and they, they, they move to try to do something, whether it's, you know, move public policy, move laws that uh, create mechanisms for these, you know, for, for, for funding for these programs, better funding, uh, better resources, better personnel. So the movie, to, you know, to my great joy as a filmmaker, it's not about just somebody seeing the film and saying, oh, that's a good film, and they leave. But mm. they see the film and they say, what can I do? And that's the effect that it's having, Julian, which, um, I, I, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, that's the ultimate. Definitely, definitely. And, and what about... Um... Just the, the man on the street, um, I mean, someone in Boston, the U.S., or even, you know, outside of the U.S., what, what, what do you hope to, for them to experience, you know, when they watch the same normal? Yeah, when they see it, that they, um, they begin to have a better understanding of these young people. Again, mainly when we see young people involved in gangs or what have you, 
it's on the evening news and it's in a very negative light and we never get to hear their story. We never do. So one thing that I'm hope, hoping that anybody who sees the film gets from it is a better understanding for those who don't live around our community, because those who live here know. <laughs> they know some of the challenges. But for those who do not, it opens their eyes and it creates empathy because they see the situation of people in a very different, uh, as I said, uh, very like human beings, just like themselves. And they see an organization like Street Safe that's successfully doing this, you know, working with these young people to turn their lives around. So that's what I want. First, they have an understanding, they have empathy. And then once you have that, I think people are then, um, they're motivated to try to help. And the fact that um, Julian, just to mention, the film uh, was picked up by Showtime, the networks. So in, it started showing on the, uh, across the US on uh, Showtime and the movie channel in August. And it, it's a two year deal. So that's the other thing where people all across the country are able to see it. And we're hoping to take the film to different cities in the United States uh, so that we can show it and then motivate donors and so on to give to those organizations in those cities. Because because it's you know it's centered in Boston, but I mean right. as as we were talking, this is an issue you can find in other states, all over other cities, and also even in Trinidad and Tobago. Right you know? in Trinidad and Tobago, in Brazil, it's all over, and we're not doing a very good job of taking care of our young people. So the way I see it, Julian, if you don't, I mean, some of these young people are brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. They're intelligent. They've given the opportunity. And we're wasting that human resource. Those, those young people could be, you know, uh, giving so much to the city, the country, if we did it different, rather than locking them up. So that's one of the things I'm hoping that this film and other organizations that's doing this work, it just, just does bring light to that. Because in Trinidad, hopefully, you know, in Boston, they, they try to. Uh, but I think they could do a much better job. We know it's a, a problem in Chicago, Atlanta, LA, because there are gangs all there. So the thing, is, I've been a filmmaker in Boston, Julian, and when I make a film it, about issues in Boston, it resonates across the country. People, it's the same issue, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing wherever you are. Definitely. And through the film, we, um, I remember talking, yeah, and some of the young men talking about this one had skill in music. This one had skill in basketball. I actually see some of them get involved in music. You have the young man yep. who work at the gym. But this, this is um, a lot of potential that we kind of just allow them to waste. Yeah, there's a lot of talent. Because think about it, Julian. If these kids, okay, they're out, uh, you know, selling drugs. They're entrepreneurs, right? Think about it. And they have a hierarchy. This guy's on the lookout. So they're the ones planning all that. So why can we put that not in a business like the drug trade, but mm -hmm. put them to work for a company, right? So we have to think about it like that because they're brilliant. When you think about it, the, you know, when you think about the structure of what they're doing out there on the streets and not to be caught and you, you figure, wow, this is, a, this is an entrepreneur. Now, you know, um, you know marijuana is, is becoming legal so now, but they're not the ones that they, they're going to benefit from that, the businesses for that. Definitely. All right, well, congrats on Thank the you. Show and Showtime and so forth. And thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. And everyone, thanks for joining us for this Q&A. All right, and don't forget, you can catch They Say Normal, all the great films that are showing today. And you can check it out on ttfilmfestival.com website. We can find information, we can buy tickets. And check out what films are upcoming as well. All right. So again, Rudy, congrats on the film. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And uh, just happy to be showing it for my folks in Trinidad. So that's good. Well, we're happy to view it. And I mean, your success. <laughs> Thank you. A little bit of that success too. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it, man. No Take problem. care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Right. See you later. All right.